Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, doing another movie review this week of another bad comedy called Another You. Yeah, part of the double feature pack with Loose Cannons that I just show you uh, during my last review of the film, which stars two comic legends, Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder, in their fourth and final film together since Silver Streak. Both of them had teamed up together in three great comedies, Silver Streak, Stir Crazy, and my favorite, See No Evil, Hear No Evil. And unlike Another You, those films were really funny, hilarious, had a lot of heart to it. It was clever, wittier. I mean, you just never forget. I mean, you can even tell that they were both having fun together, even though they're not really best friends in real life. And they were great together. They know that they're a class act. And sadly, they're no longer with us. This one is just a dull, unfunny, has a slow pacing, considering it's only 94 minutes. Like, it tries to be funny with some of those uh, moments that they have here, but it just fell really flat on its face. It's a story about two liars. Yeah, one is a professional con man, that's Richard Pryor, and the other is a pathological liar of a mistaken identity, and that's uh, Gene Wilder. Yeah, with that top hat of his, <laughs> right there. And he has like a nice uh, hat. Well, this is going to be an interesting one because um, Another You was a critical and box office financial failure. And not only that, but the film was originally directed by Peter Bodanovich, you know, the same director who gave us The Last Picture Show. It was actually going to be shot, which actually was shot, six weeks until their final day and then they learned that uh, Bodanovich was fired so they were going to get a new director to replace him and that turned out to be Maurice Phillips and they had to reshot the whole movie only this time in a new location which is Los Angeles so they're about to play the same characters all over again but with a different setting it even features uh, Mercedes Rule you know, who's a very sexy, uh, quirky, and great actress who later went on to do the film from the same studio, TriStar. The Fisher Kane with Robin Williams, God rest his soul, funny comedian, and Jeff Bridges. That's by director Terry Gilliam, been known for giving us uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail among other films that he's been doing in his career, like Brazil, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, Twelve Monkeys. Yeah. That's a better film, actually. Because that's also a comedy. It also joins in as a drama, too. It tries this hard to become as memorable and with some of those other scenes and you can pretty much tell that both of them were dead on water. I mean, Pryor looked like he was completely ill, which makes sense because it was due to the complications of multiple sclerosis ever since that accident that he had a long time ago, which you could tell he wasn't exactly himself. But he, he was getting there. He was becoming more mellow than ever. Uh, Wilder, on the other hand, he just lost his wife, uh, Gilda Radner, the comedian from Saturday Night Live. Long time uh, marriage um, before her death due to ovarian cancer. And he just had another film called Funny About Love, which was a, a pretty lame romantic comedy by Leonard Nimoy, you know, the the actor who turned director has been best known for playing Spock in Star Trek. Yeah. Because he just directed the film, uh, not only the Star Trek sequel, The Voyage Home, but he also directed Free Man and a Baby. 
which is a very successful comedy that I love. Yeah. So this was really sad. This was uh, Pryor's um, final uh, starring role and Wilder's final theatrical role that these both had ever had. Because, and back to the supporting cast, uh, besides Mercedes Rule, we have an earlier performance by Vanessa Williams. This, I believe, might be her screen debut. It also has Kevin Pollack. That might be one of his earlier roles. Um, and even Stephen Lane from Manhunter, who went on to become um, very successful in his career. You know, went on to do other films like The Hard Way, plays the villain in that. And he went on to do um, other work too. Like he went on to do Avatar, and, and he had a show uh, that was on Fox uh, called Terra Nova. Yeah. Yeah, Stephen Lane. And he also had the film Last Exit to Brooklyn. So I think everyone would know who he is. Now Mercedes Rowe, of course, um, once again, she was in Big, Married to the Mob, Fisher King, once again, which she won the Oscar for her performance. And um, she was in the Lost in Yonkers uh, by Neil Simon, and that's a film I also love, um, which uh, she played Bella. That's one of her greatest performances. Um, I can see why this comedy was totally uneven and unfunny, but I guess t I, I never knew this was going to be such a trouble production, but that's what happens. So let's just get to the review. Um, stars, once again, Richard Pryor, along with Gene Wilder, both no longer with us, sadly, yeah, because... Pryor passed away in 2005, and Wilder passed away in 2016. But they were always hilarious, you know, legendary comedians, and they will always be remembered, no matter what. Um, Mercedes Rule, Stephen Lane, Vanessa Williams, uh, Kevin Pollack, Vincent Scavia Belli, no longer with us either. But he, he was been in other stuff too, like he was in the movie as the teacher in the film Better Off Dead with John Cusack. He was also in the movie Ghost. Um, even Tomorrow Never Dies, uh, the James Bond film with Pierce Brosnan, uh, among others. And Craig Richard Nelson. It's written by Ziggy Steinberg, you know, who actually had work uh, with stand-up uh, comedies, uh, joining in with George Carlin, you know, the legendary stand-up comedian. Yeah, among other comedies that he's worked on. He's also a producer of the film, too. And it's directed by Maurice Phillips. The movie began set in Los Angeles. We meet a professional con man named Eddie Dash, who's played by Richard Pryor, who's under an assignment for community service after he was arrested so he's going around you know making more money and helping out everyone he was also playing the saxophone but he wasn't really playing it because all that saxophone music was straight from his boombox yeah so he's just going around you know driving around in his uh, classic car yeah, he just goes um, to one place or the other, you know, trying to go, um, trying to go to an office building uh, where he gets to meet um, an unscrumptious business manager named Rupert Dibbs, who's played by Stephen Lane, yeah, who's the main villain of this film. But he's also friends with a former mental patient and a pathological liar named George, who's played by Gene Wilder who's being released from the hospital, which has a joke where an airplane suddenly uh, flies uh, in low air straight through the building and it starts shaking like it's an earthquake that's ready to happen. While he was doing his session with all the rest of the patients, including Phil, played by Kevin Pollack, who does a damn good impression of Peter Falk as Columbo while reading all these... Uh, Celebrity Magazines, uh, which has a cover of Tom Hanks on there. 
So anyway, um, Eddie took uh, George uh, straight to Hollywood Wax Museum so he could work there doing his community service, but his friend actually scares him off, you know, dressed up as uh, Frankenstein until he bumps into a guy named Al. He was about to send him money, and he was under the, the case of mistaken identity quickly and, and purposely as a millionaire brewery hare named Abe Fielding. So, to help things out, uh, George decided to invite Eddie to a local restaurant where everyone seems to know who he is, yeah, Abe Fielding, and he actually had to wear a top hat this big that's like <laughs> Abraham Lincoln but taller. The act of truthness here. So he just goes around with yeah, he just goes around with uh, Al and uh, the rest of um, his friends and of course Eddie joining in. But he actually had a, a joke where he just where he actually pushes his head all the way through his face and just goes around telling him don't you ever call my friend a shithead. If you do I'll cut your balls off. And I'm very good at it. That sort of thing. I gotta admit, that was a little funny, but it was a running gag. So then, that's when the limbo arrives, um, after they just finished their conversation, you know, their business and stuff. That's where we meet Elaine, uh, a very sultry, sexy uh, girl, uh, sexy girl that Fielding has. Is played by Mercedes Rule, which sadly isn't getting along with very well. Because, I mean, for obvious reasons. Um, of course, she does look good in lingerie. So George was trying to find a way to um, make it up for her. Because the fact that he's the one that lied to her. Um... With Eddie joining in to help. But anyway, um, Rupert, however, hired Eddie to actually try to believe for George that he is fielding in order to kill him off so he can take over his uh, family uh, inheritance and his fortune and the entire brewery that he owns. So, his attempt uh, for Eddie was to capitalize on George's mistaken identity. Rupert had to send um, Eddie and George all the way to uh, duck hunting. Yeah, when they went to uh, Rupert's um, house. So, of course, he actually put the mic on George thinking that you know, Eddie was going to shoot him. So they're just going around you know, duck hunting and... And then they actually spotted a bear. Yeah, the bear was actually very nice. Uh, he was very kind to George, but then Eddie was about to shoot him. But George uh, tries to block him not to, but then you hear two gunshots, thinking that Eddie actually did kill George. But in reality, that never happened. So he, yes, this is the truth where... George actually fakes his death, coming back, um, you know, during a funeral at the brewery, and joining in with the rest of of everyone, his family and all that, which are just actors. Yeah. So that's where we had like a scene at the end where where there was a fight between uh, Rupert and George and. And Rupert just stuck uh, George inside the, the brewery machine where they make all the beer. And everyone just joins in, takes the coffin, crashes into the chronogenics uh, room where all the brewery is. And they try to stop, and they stop the machine. And the entire uh, brewery machine foams up with all that beer. And he just drinks it all. Wow. And that's where he finally inherits both the brewery and his fortune. Both Eddie and George had became Rupert's female associates into allies and partners, and while getting themselves plenty of 
of all these chaos that's happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you also got uh, Vanessa Williams uh, playing uh, Gloria, so which uh, Eddie had met uh, at the beginning, and yeah, saying all these uh, dialogues and stuff. Yeah. Uh, the movie was just pretty dull, uneven, slow pacing all the way. I mean, there are parts that that are funny, but then there are other parts that aren't. Uh, I guess I could say that the Trust or Pictures logo was more memorable than the rest of the film. You know, the one where where they show the logo of the Pegasus uh, coming by and just jumping or leaping straight into the T for Tristar. And, and this is where you hear Richard Pryor doing his commentary while he in, hearing the sound effects of the Pegasus uh, just running all the way and then he just goes around saying now easy steady boy and then the wings just pops up and he says whoa fucking wings what's going on and he crashes and then he just goes around saying fucking white horse yeah I, I know at the end they uh, at the movie he just Wilder has his uh, stint where he says don't ever call my friend a shithead again okay yeah. Uh, you, you can pretty much tell that Pryor isn't looking very well. He looks so ill, as evidence here, because of the multiple sclerosis that he was getting. Um, but Pryor did try his best to be as funny as he could be. Uh, Wilder, on the other hand, did try it as hard as he could. I mean, he just pretty much mumbles and and stutters. Um, throughout his performance and I mean I, I guess you couldn't blame him because you know he's having you know difficulty trying to remember who he is um, I, I mean it, it's a it's kind of hard to remember this film because of the way the pacing goes uh, there there's other uh, scenes in the film that tries to work but it didn't like for example uh, prior, you know, playing the saxophone, which, which one of the band members actually spotted him and wanted him to be on stage. So he plays the saxophone, right? But he doesn't have his boombox with him. He he does play it, but he plays it terribly. But he gives it a pass from everyone. They did another scene like that too, but with uh, George, where he suddenly um, does his. Um, <laughs> this yodeling and he joins in with uh, Elaine so they both yodel uh, <laughs> even though one of the audience actually boo at him and they say you suck yeah. uh, Steve Elaine just plays the villain as usual in those films where he's just going around you know trying to kill him off but he fails to do so I mean the fact that he hires uh, Elaine Gloria and all the rest of the actors, you know, to join in for the scheme and all this other chaos happening. I mean, that that's just how how bad this movie was. It's really sad because you know Pryor and and Water deserve better together. I mean, they were funnier in all three of these films, and it really shows how class act they were. And it's just sad that they just blew it on this film. So this is like a death sentence or something. And Mercedes Rowe has her moments. Uh, again, sexy, sultry. Tries to do her best to um, to get to know George better. You know, trying to fix all these mistakes that George had, and just have a nice uh, relationship with each other. And I know Pryor was doing his best to get to know uh, Vanessa Williams's character. I know they try to have a funny, another funny scene at the dentist, you know, where George was at the dentist, where we see Vincent Scahilavelli as a dentist, and then the, but then they, both Eddie, Gloria, and even Elaine just came by to stop him, because they, they were afraid they were going to kill him off, but they weren't, and then suddenly the laughing gas went off, and they were all laughing, completely. 
Yeah. I would have loved to see the original cuts with Peter Bogdanovich. Because the film was already shot in New York. And I would have loved to see the difference between the theatrical cut to the original one that's that actually looked quite better, quite different. Because I, I have a feeling that even the original cut was a lot better, as it seems. But then I heard that that um, I think uh, Peter was having some some ego issues or something. Maybe he wasn't getting along, or I don't know what, what was happening. Or Pryor was just, well, according to Pryor, he did say that he got personality and professionally fucked on that film. So they had to fire him and hire someone who can take over and change the location. So, I mean, I, I guess, you know, he was really having some problems. So, I don't know. It, it, that sucks, man. Because this has got to be one of uh, Ziggy Steinberg's uh, really uh, unfunny script. Totally pale and, and dull. I mean... I don't know what was happening. I mean, this is just incredibly forgettable. And that's why it's considered to be one of Gene Wilder's and Richard Pryor's worst film together. No doubt about it. So I, I advise you to, if you love to watch um, Gene Wilder and, and Richard Pryor in action, I mean, stick to the first three films. They're way better. This one should be clearly forgotten, never to be remembered again, unless you're curious enough to check it out just for the supporting cast, some scenes that tries to work or not or whatever, but it just doesn't fit, didn't fit the tone very well. Anyway, that's another you, and I give the film one star. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later, much later. Bye.